Welcome, everyone. It's Friday. It's great. It's been a long two weeks. Lots of uh, lots of madness in the Mass Timber March madness, but great presentations. I really enjoyed them. Learned a lot. And uh, now today, um, actually, uh, full disclosure, I work with Stefan Schneider. He's my business partner at Cut My Timber. And since I'm not giving a presentation, didn't schedule one for the month, I'm joining Stefan in this presentation. So we're kind of like co-presenters. Uh, he'll be going over the PowerPoint, and then we'll take questions. But to start things, I think, Stefan, I'll have you introduce yourself, and then I'll introduce myself and our background and how we started the company. So if you could introduce yourself. Okay, well, I'll start with Happy Friday, everybody. It's, we almost made it for the week. Um, it's I'm happy to you know be here with in a great group. I was a little nervous so far. The presentations were really good, so it's like, well, I don't know what, how much more to add, but we we sure have something to say. Um, yeah, my name is Stefan Schneider. I'm uh, basically a, a wood and software guy, kind of in, in one in one package, if you want. Um, I'm from Switzerland, and I came to the U.S. Uh, 20 years ago. Now, so it's crazy how fast time goes. Um, but yeah, I want to talk to you today a little bit about mass timber digital fabrication and, and more so more of a hands-on practical approach with, you know, what, what we used to have, what we have right now for, for digital tools, uh, software and hardware, uh, show a few projects, how we did it. And I also want to talk about the whole process of, of getting something like that started kind of more on a, on a more practical hands-on approach. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about that some more, but that's sort of quickly my background, and um, I'll you know walk you through those few slides today. And Greg uh, is uh, friendly enough to help me out, and we we kind of we decided we want to do more of a you know kind of a Friday coffee session with with some hopefully interesting um, topics. Yeah, thanks everyone. I um, want to give my kind of the background since I work with stuff on have for I don't know more than a dozen years. Um, the, the, the reason I got here is I've owned a construction company for many years, and I also uh, had a technology company in Silicon Valley way back in 2000. Uh, did that for a couple of years, completely unrelated to construction. And then I said, I want to be in construction, but if I'm going to do it, I want to do it in the most technical, scalable, efficient way possible. So I visited many, many prefab factories in Canada and the US, and also talked to many all over Europe from the Nordics to Germany. And essentially my research said, well, who has the most finely tuned machine? Who, how, do, how does the process go from an architect's design intent to the factory? And how is that process handled? And to me, that became a software question and a hardware question. And I got to the point where I found that in North America, it was primarily HSB CAD Dietrichs and CAD work that was being used at most of the companies. So I called up those companies and uh, each of them. And I said, well, look, you, how many customers do you have in North America? Uh, who is your best customer in sense, the most efficient? And uh, who is the most advanced? Because I want to sell and build those homes on the U.S. West Coast. And that's how I found Stefan. And I said, hey, you're, you're the person. You're the guy working for CAD work. You're traveling all over Canada and the U.S. You're setting up all these factories. I want to work with the most advanced factory uh, that the most, most, yeah, the most technical, the most efficient, the most scalable, which one is that? Who should I work with? And he declined to name us any specific company. He simply told me like, well, I can't refer you to anyone who's completely have everything figured out. So I can't good conscience do that. And which was not the answer I wanted at all. So over time, I said, well, since you're the person setting up these factories, why don't you set up your own factory? You know how to do it. The market's booming. And why don't you do it on the West Coast in the middle of all these forests? And that was many years ago. And that's how Cut My Timber got started. And Stefan, you can tell more about the idea of Cut My Timber when we originally kicked it off. Yeah, yeah. So maybe it's just back to, you know, who is it? You know, what Craig was looking for is essentially a factory that would do a whole house fully digital. So wall panels, wood components, the whole thing. And at the time, there really wasn't anybody in North America. So we saw that in Europe, there were companies like Rankly and, and, and others. Um, 
that would do that would deliver a whole house completely fully machined and 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 you know windows in the walls whatnot but that was very new in in the north american market so we had on hand we had the timber framers they were pretty advanced you know doing mortars and joining mortars and tenon you know joinery and and uh, and complex geometry that kind of required or made the most sense to to use that kind of te technology and at the time there's also there's companies they started doing more panels but it was just the industry just wasn't there that had to do with certifications and and inspections and and whatnot and also the fact that that people here typically had a a general contractor on site that was essentially the builder and and not just somebody that would sell a whole house so so that's why the answer is like i don't really know because that isn't there later pretty quickly companies started doing that some very successful orders not so much um it's it's difficult to pull that off and it, it really i think that it works best if you have a, either a completely integrated linear uh, system where, where you do the design and engineering and the delivery and everything or you'd have to have some sort of a informal vertical integration where you have partner companies that each have their specialty and that's kind of the direction we're we're working now just because we're, we're too small to do everything and uh, and it's really difficult and expensive to do everything and so that's kind of a you know for smaller players that's that's the ticket um Cut my timber. What is it all about? And it's like I said, I'm a software guy a little bit, and I'm a, I'm a mostly I'm a, a timber guy. My dad has a little timber frame company, and they did everything by hand, and it was hard. And I remember when I was very little, I saw the very first. I think it was a PA ton digger, and, and we went there, and I was like, wow, this thing is amazing. And I couldn't do that much at the time, and it was really expensive. And but uh, we walked away there in a way, and my dad says like, well, this thing is going to change everything, and and it did. But for us, that was always important. Let's embrace the craftsmanship. Let's take what, you know, those two gentlemen, one is the one on the left is a German master carpenter and on the right is an American one. But what they both have in common, they've been doing that for years and years and they know the tricks and whatnot. And, and so I wanted to be the guy that knew the tricks with the machine, basically. We're a, let's, let's do that kind of stuff too and let's try to make it easier so we can do it you know like more scalable and and, and whatnot so <clears throat> we've cut my timber at the time i was working for catwork for many years that was a great job i got a lot of insight into a lot of factories all, all over the north america uh, you know timber framers and lock home builders a lot of really small companies that didn't have machines but also really big companies that wanted to do you know the full house package kind of a deal but we didn't have much money we didn't want to sell out to start with and and so the idea is like we can do 80 percent of the work and the value add basically with you know maybe 10 percent of the capital investment and, and the trick really boiled down to do the software and uh, we'll, we'll talk some more about that but there's a lot more to, to those programs than just the design aspect of it so the whole managing those job sites managing fabrication order lists packing lists all that stuff so that's really you can save or lose a lot of money to a point where you could sort of make a project a nightmare by not doing that on the front end. So we really try to do as much as we can the front and then have a little bit of an easier time um, down the road. So what does that boil down to? I don't want to go too much into the BIM, but we're always, we talk about FIM, like fabrication information modeling. Uh, what, what is that? And, you know, like if people ask me, oh, how do you program those machines? I usually say, well, we don't really program it. We, you know, we, we just kind of, um, I mean, we just create machine files, but this is not hardcore programming with just zeros and ones. This is like uh, more of a, I would refer it as a digital shop drawing, uh, a list of what do we need to do to a certain part in a, in a machine readable format, if you want. But we had a lot of like, oh, I have a 3D model, just feed it into your machine. And, and you know, that goes from, you know, SketchUp 3D models or 3D, uh, like kind of 2D drawings that were twisted into 3D perspective views, all the way to fairly accurate uh, BIM models 
But, uh, you know, we talked about that in a previous presentation this week uh, with Fabio and Scherer, like mostly those models lack of, of fabrication information. So what, what is a fabrication information model or, or what, what's additional to, to compare to, I want to say, a highly detailed, accurate uh, BIM model. So uh, I'm sure everybody or most of you are familiar with those LOD definitions. LOD stands for level of development, and it starts from you know, 100, 200, and then 400 is essentially the highest model, and then there's an LOD 500, but it doesn't have more information. That's more of, you know, been for um, for facility management and whatnot. So that doesn't really uh, pass 400. There isn't anything more in the, in the BIM level. But what we need is process data in relation to the whole model. So uh, we would add for instance, I give you an instance for a, you know, we process a lot of blue line beams or now with, with uh, LVL and, 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 and uh, MPP beams. Those beams, you can just draw them around. So there's a lamination direction. Um, there is also a, a glue line typically has a dedicated top side. So you can't just, you know, rotate the beam. And that's really important that that information is in a model. And most BIM models, we don't really have that. So there is not really a site defined as a as a reference site that needs to go to, against the machine fence. There's not a, a site that says, hey, this is the top. And, and once you export those pieces or single pieces, that information is essentially not there anymore. We also already define what kind of basically how we're going to cut that. And we do that in the model where we see the whole job, not, not just one piece. And that's also different. If you only have one piece that may look good for that piece, but you don't know where it connects. And then we also on the front end, we do a lot of nesting that's really, really important for panels, but also with, with beams, we have like basically a linear uh, length optimization where we nest those beams using a longer beam to make a bunch of short pieces. So how does that practically work? Um, you know, we basically, it's like from an ID to the machine, or what we do is we go from geometry to machine code. So you have a, on one hand, line work and, and geometry data. And on the other hand, you need to have basically a machine that understands what to do. So um, I'm going to just, like like I say, uh, you know, full disclosure, we work with CAD work, but there is other, you know, technical 3D tools on the market. Um, so people, let's just say an architect comes to us and says, hey, I have this, um, this 3D model in Revit, like, like here, and it's fully detailed level, you know, 400 and, you know, just send it to your machine. So what we would do typically, and I'm going to kind of switch forward and backward, we will convert that. And that doesn't have to be a Revit model, by the way. That could be an AutoCAD 3D geometry. That could be vector work, solid works. You know, um, you name it, it, it has to be a 3D solid, but that could be anything. It, it can't be a SketchUp model or, or uh, just a 2D AutoCAD drawing. So if we, if we get that, we have to do a different uh, process. But typically, we, we take those models, we create uh, uh, what we call an exchange format. And this is more just sort of a suitcase, how you get it from one tool to the next one. But uh, these days, uh, all the BIM stuff is pretty much running through IFC uh, files. Uh, we do a lot of uh, ACES SAT files if the front end supports that. We do step files and so on. And then we take it into CAD work and uh, show you that. And then the same job basically looks like that. And, and you know, never mind the visualization, that, that doesn't really matter how it's visualized. What matters here is when we import, we're going to go through every single component. We add a reference site, we add a length axis and that length axis is essentially how the piece is going to run for the machine we would convert holes we would add drillings to them uh, drilling axis and so on so that's kind of so this is still quite a bit of work and 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 again in an ideal world that's all we would have to do and, and there is ways to do that somewhat automated but often we go through these things and we find collisions or it's like well wait a minute how is that actually gonna you know, go together on site. So we, while we do that, and that has nothing to do with the machining, but it has to do a lot of with the, the value add we do on our end is, is really 
buildability. Like, can that, can this thing be built the way it's designed? And and often the answer is no. It's like which piece would go in first, and whatnot. But that's just something design teams don't typically do. They just like this is a, you know, it's more of a highly technical display of a of a design intent but but they mostly just like well this just needs to be built and then you know like the builders kind of figure that out and at that time it's all too late so so that's kind of what we go and then from there we run a, a tool where basically that the program checks every single piece in there and sees which one is uh you know do we have 10 times the same post or there are 10 different posts and and they would take into account things like lamination directions or drilling directions splinter free options and stuff like that so from there we would run a um basically a, a machine we call it the machine interface but the tool looks at each single component and it looks at geometry and kind of decides what is it that we need to process so here we have a, a beam with a scarf joint on each end and so uh within cad work and i'm sure other fim tools are the same way when we cut the scarf that's a macro and there's already a machine process sort of attached to it or with other work that the software already knows what that is but if i would just kind of manually model that scarf joint we run it through that process recognition uh, tool and it just checks the geometry and say hey this looks like a scarf joint or hey this looks like a a, a tenon and then it would basically add a tenon and then when we export it it will create a tenon process or a, a scarf joint process on, on the cam end so what you see on the right hand side here is um is the Handegger uh, software that runs on most of their K2 machines. What we'll talk about that uh, some more. The K2 is sort of their, you know, do it all beam processor machine, very, very powerful machine. And um, most people still use that software. So there's a new software called Cambium that is more involved. And, and that's also something we see as those machines become more, um, more advanced. There is more possibilities to do the same thing with different tools and in different ways so let's just say you have a machine with two spindles and tool changers there's almost endless possibilities how uh, you know a scarf chunk like that could be cut you know are we just gonna use the mill head to do it all are we gonna pre-cut with the saw some and then use the mill head to clean it out and, and so there's pros and cons to that and it has to do with with the geometry of the part but also you know the quality and it's usually nicer quality versus versus uh quicker processing time and, and things like that so with the older machines we didn't have so much of a choice so we never really had to worry about that and the newer machines allow to do a lot more so again all of that happens in the office and and so we, we talk about uh process strategies and and that's something we sort of teach the cam tool once and then the next time it applies certain rules uh, we do uh, optimization and then we would also run the simulation that would look like something like that, where we just kind of have a, a 3D simulation so we see how is that machine actually going to cut it, and does the piece need to be rotated, uh, can the tool reach you know, a certain process, and once you do that, you'll actually find that that's something that's kind of um, you know i changed over the last few years myself too it's like when you first do that you see all those options and you look at those machines and it's just really amazing how cool it all is and then you start doing that it's like well this actually doesn't work we can't reach that angle or the uh, mill head is too short or you know so there is the more you do it the more you learn there's actually quite a bit of restrictions and and so the art or the the trick is really trying to you know best utilize your machine. Stefan, so, there's, a, Stefan yeah. there's a good question from Steve Holzer. I mean, generally, I'm going to save the questions to the end. Mm -hmm. I think this yeah. is very relevant. It says, are joint types defined in the model you import from, or do you design the connections? So again, we go probably back to here, either or. The advantage if we do that in a, in a you know, let's just say in CAD work, like I say, if I pull a, a connection or a joinery detail out of a library and, and you know tools like that they come with a, a ton of library items already in there and they're all parametric and so you set those up 
or you can create your own. So if we go that route, there's a bunch of advantages there. For one, the, you know, we, we only have stuff in the library that we know the machine can actually cut. And that's highly individual in terms of what machine and tooling you're using. Um, or, you know, often, I mean, again, an architect would probably not design, you know, a mortise and tenon and, and add, uh, you know, like a 16th of tolerance and whatnot. So, so they may just add a mortise and tenon and then we have to fine tune it. And then at that point, these connections are like what we call like solid malt, but they're not as such like a macro where it's already that, that simple. So it depends a little bit what it is. I, I would say on a mass timber chop in general, stuff everything that you cut out should be cut out and and the import model ideally and um and you know the drillings at least the holes should be in there and then we can run a, a routine where we replace holes with with drillings and whatnot so so that's individual and and the reality is you know unless people that are in the design and work with those machines before or, or have a certain knowledge what they can do and how you know the designer is probably not going to have the most efficient best um joinery design so that's really where we spend a lot of hours working with, with architects and engineers and kind of going for backward yes it's so there's always a compromise for me there's four things there's design intent there's structural engineering and everything technical engineering you know fireproofing and all of that that's a big component um another component is, is fabrication you know can it be machined and we'll talk some more about that when i talk about machine friendly design and then there's also buildability um that's a huge thing like that the coolest joint is no good if you can't install that piece or if it suddenly takes a half a day to sort of sleeve it in with free cranes rather than just kind of pop it into place so i don't know if that answers the question greg and, and steve yeah i think you're mute greg greg you're mute i guess i keep talking since greg is cut off <laughs> Yeah, I can, I can continue. No, no, go ahead. Uh, you wanted to say something. No, that's good. Uh, continue with the slides. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll run, but that's essentially what we do. But I firmly believe, and again, if we look in Europe, that, that the really successful companies, they have a lot of in-house design, they have in-house engineering. And I, I think that's where the big opportunity lies. And, and that doesn't mean you have to have an in-house engineer, but you know what that means is working closely as a team. This is not just one party making a decision. And, and unfortunately, a lot of projects that come to us, they're already highly detailed stuff is already done. And, and, um, and then it's like, wow, you know, this could have been done a lot cheaper if it would have been designed a, a little different. So we'll we'll talk some more about that when we look at some of our projects. We we love working with with design teams and engineers. Um, just and I, I think we can often you know bring in some good ideas that in the end, uh, if nothing else, at least makes the life of the installer easier, but but often also saves a lot of money. So let's just talk about digital fabrication advantages. Um, actually, I'm sorry, I'm on the backtrack a little bit, just really fast. If we can't import those models, we basically have to create it. And we do that a lot too. So things like from SketchUp, uh, from photos, from internet downloads, PDFs, we basically take that. And, and there is not a single project that runs for our shop that we don't have a 3D model of it. So even if we just need to cut the beam to length, we typically just put that in 3D real quick and export it to the machine. It's just it's just that much more accurate. But there is no way currently to just kind of take a 2D thing and make it 3D or, or take you know stuff like uh you know that isn't full 3D solid like mostly like SketchUp data. That's just that not there. And and often these these models also lack of, of detail and accuracy that that would even make sense. So um, going back here to the advantages. So on the right hand, that's kind of um, what you see now. So those machines become more and more complex. So this is a multiple you know, tool unit 
um, uh, machine, you know, the multiple five axis heads and whatnot. And so the more units we have, the more tooling, the, the more flexible we are, but also the more difficult that all becomes. But what, what's the main advantage? Or why, why would you say, hey, I'm I'm a timber framer and I'm a mass timber guy and I have a chainsaw or a fell machine? Like, what, why would you need uh, to go the digital route? And, and the answer to that is, I mean, there is different thoughts, but uh, but often it boils down of and, and capacity, repetitive accuracy, and, and just accuracy in general. So if you have to do a, a really long tapered cut and stuff like it, stuff that is incredibly difficult to do by hand, some of those processes, the machines just do it really well, like drilling a six inch hole in a 12 inch beam, you know, here we would just route it out that that's hard to do by hand. Um, I think overall we're more predictable in terms of of tolerances, accuracy, error, and then also in terms of you know like how long is that going to take us to machine all of that. So those tools they will give us a runtime. So before we even get the wood, we know this is going to take an hour to cut it, or it's going to take ten hours. And and you know we do the pricing sort of based on that too. It's like the you know and sometimes just tweaking it a bit makes that quicker. Um, we also see, I mean, the two gentlemen on the first page, these guys are getting old, burned out and uh, bad back. I mean, I'm almost approaching that age too, but it's, there isn't that many really skilled craftsmen in, in, um, in, in, in this market or, or anywhere. And the ones that are there, they're busy and, and they, they're expensive. So that, that's a, a downside. And, and um, with the industry growing at the rate that this, this is, you know, this is one way to, to ramp up. Uh, we still need a lot of skilled people, but they don't necessarily have to do saws and belt sanders and that kind of stuff. Um, coordination with other domains, I think that's really important. We would really like to have all the MEP and sprinklers and all that stuff that that should be coordinated up front. And I think that's going to make it uh, a, a lot easier. And, you know, the last point is sort of an advantage, but also kind of a downside is, like I say, we don't ever cut anything that isn't 3D modeled. Well, you know, that kind of forces you, you could argue that's a, that's a bad thing, but by, by doing that, we spend, we basically built the house twice. We, we build it in a computer and then we build it again. And, and um, if I say we, this, is, this can be a, a BIM guy or that can be us. But by doing that, you really think things through. And often we see things that is like, oh, that may not gonna work that way or whatnot. So we're, we're basically able to reduce some problems by seeing them early. Um, what are the challenges? I mean, there clearly is a lot. I mean, you look, this is a factory in Switzerland, they do wall panels and, and beam processing, but you know, you're looking at several million dollars right here. That's probably with the building and everything. That's a five million dollar setup, I would guess. I, I don't know it for a fact, but these things are really expensive. Um, they they don't just come and you plug it in. I mean, realistically, this takes months to you know install it, fine-tune it. Um, the people need to learn the software. Um, I'd be lying to say I haven't really cut a bunch of expensive firewood. You know, like the, there's definitely a learning curve, and it's it's easy to make a mistake. Um, you know, after a while, you're getting pretty good about fixing things too. Um, another thing, and that was sort of the main idea too. When I started cut my timbers, like wow, people spend incredible amounts of money for those machines and a lot of them aren't always running and in fact our machine is a lot of times not running and it's really difficult to have a, one of those machines running eight hours a day non-stop if, if you do great but that the front end work is so intense and and often like either the sales or the designing or the the programming is the bottleneck. So, so that's that's also I would consider that as a challenge. We really need to do a lot of work up front. Um, we talked about that in an earlier presentation too, in standardization in the uh, mass timber and the timber industry in general. It's just not there. It's like the steel guys. They have like a, a book with all the details. Everybody knows what those are, and it's easy. And so we don't have that. Um, and that's that makes the fabrication more difficult. 
uh, material needs to be true to size, straight, and somewhat uniform. So we have a Swiss machine. The Swiss are really picky. So if I if I have a beam and it should be you know nine and a quarter inch deep and it's only nine and an eighth, the machine tells me it's like, hey, that beam is undersized. And you know you can set that or turn it off. But uh, in general, if our material is not true to size, which often it isn't, that that causes a, a lot of issues in in prefabrication. In, in general, it has nothing to do with the machining. It's just we we build true to a model, and everything works as long as as everything is is what it should be, and that's sometimes not the case. And then you know, uh, other downsides are limitations of equipment. We'll, we'll talk about that here in a second too. I mean, there is, like I said, there's a lot of restrictions more than people think they are. Um, Craig, do you have anything else to add there? Maybe from an economical point of view, you can maybe give a little bit of insight. Mute. Break, mute. Break, you're in mute again. Yeah, no, I just, I do want to address just using economic terms, it's capacity utilization. Essentially, how much, how often is your machine running and then how much value add is it doing? You know, what, what, what value is it creating to the wood product? I mean, we talked prior to the presentation began, the sheer uh, density, the sheer number of mass timber factories there are in Germany, Switzerland, and Austria compared to the US. And then the difference in the input, the quality of the wood and how, how, how much they run. That, that whole supply chain compared to the potential, the, the vast North American market. Since you're from there, well, go ahead, address that issue. Yeah, that, that was a huge issue. Um, I mean, we can talk about that some more, but you'll find no matter what kind of a machine you buy, it's either a German machine or a Swiss machine or an Italian machine, but it's not going to be a, a US machine and it's not a Japanese one. Unlike the steel industry that has a ton of uh, Japanese machines. And so I, I don't know why that is, but that's just what it is. And wood in, in Europe, we, we don't really work with, with solid wood anymore. It's pretty much everything um, we have is, is kill and dry. It's it's uh, it's a lot more true to size and for the better or worse, but that's just the industry is more mature that way. And we don't have trees kind of the same way we have there, but that really causes those machines are designed for uniform uh, good material. And I'll give you a quick thing and then we'll have to move on. But when I started working in a US wall panel factory, we, we had a machine or a whole line, there's actually three of those machines where you see here that photo on the right, it's a it's a wall panel machine. This is uh, called a multifunction bridge, but that basically lays OSB and, and routers out, nails off. But they also had uh, a framing station where, where basically there was an automated setup that would grab the studs and, and put it in place and, and nail it off and basically frame the wall. And so this was working, the whole feed was done with with a vacuum suction cup. So I would just go on a, on a stack of two by six and, and suck those up. And there would be, you know, pretty much every time that gripper would, would grab a, a row of two bys, they would just fall down and kind of essentially block the machine and turn everything off in, in panic mode. Just because the, the studs, if you buy number two, studs these days that's kind of what we get here you can't suck those with a, with a vacuum system and especially not one that has like six ports side by side and they're just not flat enough and and things like that or, or there's a lot of you know like crippers or rollers that will get blocked and, and we we fight that too and it, it's really kind of it's you know the material coming out is, is as good as the stuff you send in and if you have bad stuff going in it, it's really difficult so, so that is a challenge. I think it got a little better uh, that the Europeans adopted the market a little bit for more, you know, less good lumber. And, and I think in, in general, the people in the US and Canada that are doing that, they realize that and they tend to use better material. So uh, machine friendly design, that's really uh, important. Uh, essentially, it's really simple. It's like, we want to put it in the machine, run it through the machine, add hardware and send it and sort it and send it to the chop site. That, that's the most efficient. What we don't necessarily want to do is like spending weeks and months with a chisel and, and, and you know, do all those things. Uh, we're happy to do that, but it costs money and it also is a new source 
of mistakes. So when we, we're gonna look at tooling a little bit here in a minute, but essentially all tools are, are round or rounded. And so the result of it is when you mill out and I wanna, I don't know if you guys see my uh, pointer here, but on the very right hand side, those housings, you see how they're round. So the, the, the trick is to understand what your tooling is gonna be, what's the radius, and then you wanna make sure that the counterpart is kept the same way. So on the left side, we just, instead of using a, a square um, stair thread or a square tenon, or just basically route in the whole thread, we're just gonna do like a rounded tenon and then everything fits. And, and the tenon end is really easy to cut, but the, the mortise side or that, that, that uh, dab side is not that easy. So in the middle, this is sort of a mock-up. We used that for a real project, but that was kind of what we sort of pushed for our mass timber skeleton system. And you'll see it's a really good example. Everything is rounded. So if we start from the column to column connection, so we're using a pipe rather than a knife blade because it's a lot easier to mill. We have a laser plasma cut steel bearing plate that is rounded with the same radius as, as, the, as the wood column is. And, and that reason for that rounding is because the CLT is cut out with, a, with an end mill rather than with a, with a chainsaw, basically. So, so like, you know, kind of figure out what are the limitations for each part, and then you're going to round everything else the same, the same radius. That's kind of a, a trick. Um, other machine-friendly stuff is, is uh, you know, again, respecting your tool you know, limitations. We've had that where we have like end crane drillings that are four feet long. It's like that there is no four foot drill bit and we just, we can't do that. Um, sometimes by changing things a little bit, we'll, we'll avoid um, blowout. I mean, the blowout is a huge thing with those machines. It, it's really, I think, uh, you know, you can cut stuff fairly quickly just running it through, but, but having it through without having major blowout, that's not that easy. And then also uh, rotations and double runs. So on the beam processor, uh, you know, something like the cruiser you see, uh, we would process from all sides, but we're limited in the size of the wood. And then, um, you know, if we do like on a K2, there's a rotator, but by rotating that, that takes time. And if the beam is too big, we can't even rotate. So we'd have to take it out, manually rotate um, and put it in again. And, and that's difficult to do. We may lose accuracy. And, and it takes time and it ultimately results in cost. And then it gets really bad if we're talking CLT processing on, on panel machines. If we have to rotate a panel, that's, that's difficult, uh, time consuming, sometimes dangerous. And um, so, you know, if you can design a panel so we can do everything from the top or everything from the bottom, that's certainly the goal of machine friendly design. Um, Really quick to uh, machine restrictions. I already kind of said it that there's tooling sizes, maximum strokes, angles we can't reach. But a, a whole other issue we're facing is just the size of those beams. So the beam I'm sitting on is four foot wide, and I think it was like 40 inch or 42 inch thick. So we had to make that up from a two glue lamps and, and this is not our project on the right hand side, but uh, it's a European high riser, but uh, the biggest one. Uh, the thing is the taller we want to build with mass timber, the bigger those cross sections are. There's just no way around it. And I feel, uh, you know, those machines, we, you know, they used to be 16 inch wide, 18 inch wide throughput, then it went to 24 if you buy a large format. Now we're at four foot wide, which is great, but, but the beam width is really, not quite there yet. So for columns, if we have a 24 inch by 24 inch column, there's very few machines that can actually process that. So that, that's an issue, but that's just something to consider. And I, I don't have the answer. I think in the end, those machines just have to become bigger. Um, tooling, we talked about that, but basically all those beam processors and the gantry machines we use, um, we use saws, compound saws, really big, you know, three foot diameter saw blades. We use uh, what we call universal mill. That's the picture on the right. So that's basically a planar head. We use that for, uh, you know, for everything we can. That leaves a really nice surface and it takes off a lot of material quickly. Uh, we use a lot of uh, end mills, finger mills, the ones you see uh, on the bottom. And, um, you know, then obviously drills, we use auger bits. And then some machines also have slot cutters and that can be basically a fancy version of a chainsaw 
or or um, we can also do slots with with saw blades, which that's the much better way of doing it. But then you have the limitation of of the rounding again. Ah, tolerances <laughs> to go a little faster here. Um, it, it, it's pretty simple, and it is not. And I don't have the answer what the right tolerance is. But I I think that's something for us as an industry. Again, the, the steel guys the steel guys work with a lot larger tolerances than we do and i think we're trying and that, that's a, a difference i see between europe and and um and north america we're trying to build furniture with components that are four or five thousand pounds heavy and that's just really difficult so like sharp edges don't work so well and what we learned is tight is too tight so if you have a tight fit you know now you do that in the rain and against concrete and steel and stuff it's just it's usually too tight. So leave leave some room, make your connections in a way where, where we can adjust. Um, everybody always asks me, it's like, well, how accurate is your machine? And uh, my answer is always, is it's as accurate as the material you send it. So if, if we deal with undersized beams and stuff like that, that's, that's going to make it really difficult. And then uh, again, the bigger issue than the accuracy, I mean, in general, the, there is accuracy issues too, where drill bits, they could wander to the side and things like that. But the biggest challenge really is making sure everything fits, everything is in there, that we don't have a, a missing hole or, or something not done. And, and that's really, again, the modeling and, and the, the pre uh, the pre prep of, for those files. Um, Greg, you interrupt me if you have something to say. I'll just kind of blow through that a little bit. Uh, another thing we do with our 3D models is really, you know, trying to work with the installers and the builders. This is for a for a high riser that we're gonna show here in a minute. Um, you know, we we try to send out like an IKEA type kit to the site. So in an ideal world, they just they get those beams. They're already you know, kind of packaged where they go. So we work with building zones and whatnot, and, and they they come so they don't have to take everything apart. And that's not always easy to do. So on big projects that already starts from us with the incoming material, you know, we can't store 10 trucks of, of, of wood in our shop. So we would order what we need at a time and then kind of um, send that out. So again, the 3D model, that's where we do uh, site simulation, where we do loading planning. And I think that's there's a lot of opportunity. And I, we, we try to do it as good as we can. And it seems there's a lot of room for improvement too on our end and on everybody's end. There's um, it, it's difficult, and and that's really where people can speed up those those install times. So, um, and and that's something we like to work with the installer, the GC, and and the, each site is different. The, all those buildings are, you know, there's no laydown space, and it almost boils down where we need a just in time delivery, like by the hour, not by the day. And and then again, that's difficult if you ship far away. Um, Organizing parts and data, that's a huge thing. I spend hours and hours. This is a project that's the TED stage. We'll talk about that, but 12,000 timber components. And so how do you do that? And if we would have just ordered everything, this would have been a, a nightmare. And then what made it even more difficult here, that's also typical, a lot of those beams just look the same. So it's important that each beam is not only labeled with a number, but also where it goes and kind of what function it is. And the way to manage a project like that is really you, you split it in different zones, levels and groups and, and so on. And that's typical for, for I want to say, any project that has more than 100, 200 components. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I guess, the quick fly down of, of those slides. Uh, I'd like to keep going with some projects that were very interesting for me. We've done many more, but those are sort of the ones that the bigger ones are fun and more relevant to uh, mass timber. Greg, do you wanna? Okay, yeah, continue, yeah, so we can get into them so we have time for questions. So yeah, okay. go to the projects, yep. So third, third stage that, uh, like I said, this is the model you just saw. So here we are, there was, there was a really tight time frame, which is typical for event construction. So we used to do a lot of event construction. And so wood actually is a really great material if you have to create a lot of structure fast, that there was, would have been no way. We, we did this whole thing, fabrication and design in about three months, and that only worked. We had an amazing team, great engineer, great designer. And, and what we did, we standardized 
the beam sizes. So we would we basically limited everything to just very few cross sections. And then also you kind of see down the left, but everything is machined. So we didn't have to do any layout or measuring. So we would use physical pockets and dabs for each thing for assembly. And see here on the left, you see a little bit of that. There was little tenons sticking out and, and everything is labeled. So um, this is in 2014, we fabricated that. It's it set up, it's usually a five day setup and then it goes, gets used for a week and it gets torn down again. Uh, and here's kind of how we basically split that to make it more manageable. Uh, Abina Yard, everybody saw that, Lever Architecture Office is great building. That was really, our first real mass timber building. And it was kind of a coincidence. We, we came in really late in the project. Uh, Thomas Robinson met a friend of mine on a plane and uh, he was talking about he wants to do that building. And, and he suggested he will call me. And, and then we came in late and just uh, that was the first one with uh, domestic CLTs. And really, to me, this is kind of a great, I think that's where a lot of opportunity is, like simple skeleton, CLT decking, and you know, beautiful structure that isn't overly complicated or overly, I mean, it wasn't a cheap build, but it was also not overly, you know, like the whole connections and the material size and everything state manageable. Here is a 3D model of it. You'll see a lot of uh, steel that uh, has to do with like all the elevator shafts and, and basically the lateral bracing. Um, this project is in Canada on Burnaby. That was a, a pump station for a high riser. Um, uh, this one was interesting with just all the angles as everything was compound angles. It, it's a butterfly from the top, the left and the right sail is, is different. And then you know everything modeled, we, we had to do a bunch of takes to figure out all those steel columns. We modeled all of that to, to make it work. Um, it's also interesting from a structural point of view, there's a lot of uplift and the whole thing was essentially hanging upside down. Um, Block 76, uh, again, we used the, the, the RICON connectors, everything was rounded. This one went together really well. Um, Brad Nile talked about that uh, earlier this week on his presentation, so you can refer back to that. But it was a, it's a great project, very tight site, and uh, we would love to do more of, of those. And uh, it was just a great, again, great team of Anderson Construction with DR Johnson. Uh, so it worked really well, at least from our point. Uh, here's the model, and you kind of see how it was geometrically sort of challenged. I mean, it's a, a straight skeleton, but then you know, on the back wall had that kink in it and whatnot to, to match the side. And uh, to the right, we see the connections. Um, this one was a little bit more more angles, even uh, a, a bridge for Nike. This was with Carpentry Plus, so we did all the modeling uh, together with AEC. Um, and then uh, we cut the roof, uh, Bocharski cut the main uh, bridge structure. So we, we worked with um, with different companies. And that, that's also a great thing when you do everything digital, you can really, on bigger projects, you can split that out while still coordinating together. So, and uh, what we do a lot too, is we, we often deliver packages with wood and steel, and the steel is modeled by us as well. And, and uh, then we use digital practices to basically process the steel. So all the plates are laser plasma cut from the same file that we use for the wood fabrication. So if I always say it, even if it's wrong, it may be wrong, but it still fits because the wood is the same wrong as the steel. And if I say wrong as, you know, maybe a tolerance issue or a, a bolt off or something like that, that just kind of makes that, uh, that uh, a little easier. Adidas headquarters, that was uh, DR Johnson did uh, a lot of that work. Uh, they delivered all the beams and, and the panels. We, we prefabricated uh, some of the beams and then that got craned in as, as uh, modules. Uh, so uh, again, I think that this is a lever architecture, great way of combining different materials. So though they had precast concrete as well, not on that building, but on the other one. And so it's kind of used the wood where it's beautiful and where it makes sense, but then have, you know, precast concrete where the sizes with wood would have been too big. So, um, so yeah, I think that's pretty much it for the project. Um, I talked a lot, so I am happy to answer questions and, um, you know, this is what we do. I could talk about tolerances and tools and stuff for hours and hours. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let's let's take some questions if we can. Um, I guess um, here's one from Steve Holzer. Essentially, who is absorbing the liability for structural engineering design? 
it's a it's a pretty simple question it's the engineer of record in the end so uh, they stamp it uh, and we do on small projects like if somebody comes to us with a napkin sketches like hey i want to do a little timber frame entry way and uh do i need an engineer and i usually say well we can design that and an engineer in an in-house the point where this is not going to fail but then you have to go to an engineer have it stamped and they would take our drawings and, and run the numbers and, and make sure if it works and sometimes they come back because like well i need more bolts on something like bigger like that um we would work with the engineer and kind of propose details so sometimes the the, the drawings come with beams already sized but the connections are not defined and then we would work with them and kind of like hey how about this so and and that's i think there's a lot of uh value engineering potential like i remember with uh albina yard um go back here uh, they specked out i think it was inch and a half uh thick plates hanger plates um on, on two inch bearing plates uh, with all four pen walls and it was insane and, and that was just kind of the way it was designed and nobody optimized that yet and so i remember i invited the engineer and and, and thomas the architect to our shop and it's like hey i cut one of those and i could barely i was barely able to lift it it was so heavy and it's like we didn't even weld it because it would have been like you know thousand dollars for one weld it's just it's so hard and and so the uh, you know, we want to work with them, but legally, liability wise, in the end, the engineer of record says yes or no. And if they spec something we don't like, that's what we're going to have to do. That's um, it, it's really on them. So we, we're here as a, I want to say, maybe a professional help, but we're not we're not the one making the call in the end. Okay, here's OK, here's a question from Lech Bozinski. Do you fabricate the steel fittings or adapt work around the stock steel parts? source from standard fitting manufacturers yes we we do i mean it's um if you look like uh i don't know what you consider a standard fitting but if you look here for instance those are rikon connectors we installed those uh, it's a european connector it really works well for those that are not familiar with it but yeah we would uh we would route those in and work with it we work with simpson stuff um, and then on, on what I would call, you know, those I call like the off the shelf connectors. And then there's the custom ones. And, and they're like I say, we, we laser cut a lot of plates and, and uh, whatnot. And then we have a small welding shop that, that welds those. Uh, okay. But yeah, we, we work around that, uh, of course. Yeah. And here's a question Are there cases where these very large beams or columns can be combined with steel plates? Um, yeah, I mean, we've uh, done a ton of that too. It's, uh, I mean, I'm not sure if the question is in terms of just steel plate connections or if you would just literally reinforce a timber beam with, with steel or, or even making like a composite beam, like where you would have a, you know, like a, a wood beam under a steel I beam or something like that. I mean, we've, we've done all of that. We, we do beam wrap sometimes if you would really have a long span. Um, they would use big eye beams and then we would basically make a, a fake non-structural beam around and that usually is like in form of a box or so. Um, so not, not our favorite way of doing it, but sometimes that's that's all, all there is. I personally, you know, kind of from my engineering background in, in Switzerland, I, I, I'm a huge believer of, of composite cross sections. I think the next generation with high rises and stuff, I, you can't just keep upsizing a beam member. At some point, you may have to go a different route. And, and I, I see there's a lot of opportunity with, with a composite, like concrete, wood composite, beams and and you know like a rip panel uh, assembly so I, I think this is uh eventually gonna happen we saw that in an earlier presentation uh, pv hall uh, used that a little bit so uh, i think we'll see more of that yeah and uh, probably mostly concrete and wood combined because that's a, that's a good thing but then you see bridges where they're reinforced with like huge or, or big trusses where they would just have a huge steel plate that is sandwiched with two beams but often those things they would just become decorative okay there's a next question are there cases where these very large beams oh i don't excuse me i already asked that one um from mark wigston who applies the sealer to the glue lamb after cnc processing <laughs> million dollar question <laughs> so we're not a skin company we uh you know we work with horizon and eugene that they're they're much better set up they're probably the only company that i'm aware of that is set up to at scale do finishes 
in a high quality and, and sort of in an industrial matter. Did we slap on some stain? Yes, on, on the timber frame stuff, we, we use an oil. Um, you know, we do that kind of stuff, but we're, we're not a, a stain company. There, there's dust issues and other issues. And, um, you know, I, I don't know who should do it where it makes the most sense. We often get beams too that already come stained from from the glue lamp supplier uh, like the ones you're looking at it right now that's how we did it there and then we would just put end crane seal around everywhere where we mill the surface so basically the end crane and and all the the daps and stuff and then that that's a lot less um you know less uh time consuming it, it's not just the time it takes to put it on it's also the time um it takes to let it try and and rolling a beam like that is really difficult you have to do it with the crane and whatnot this is not just like rolling it by hand real quick so that that makes it time consuming uh, so, i don't know it's not really a solid answer but it's nobody wants to do it, it it's an extra step and i think we we need to do it some and i think having the raw beam stained or sealed first and then just do the end grain i think that's a good compromise Here's a question from Lack. How scalable is your experience with the event structure in terms of designing for deconstruction and reuse reconstruction? Do you think larger buildings designed for medium two to five years and long 50 years service life could be designed with a similar principle? Yes, absolutely. Uh, I'll give you an example. Like Ted, we did that first. Um, where is it here? Sorry, I'm going too far. Here we go. So this has been you know, designed and, and, and fabricated in 2014 and used every year since. So those, the main structures designed in, in sort of modules, um, it, it kind of see it here a little bit, but essentially it's a big pizza slice. So these modules, it, it's basically a box, a, a modular box that gets loaded and, and turned and you know, put on trucks. And, and so if, even after seven years, it still looks really nice. Um, are there scratches on the wood? Yes. Did we have to reinforce uh, a bunch of connections, put some more screws in over the years? Absolutely, we did that. Um, and, you know, this is more when you rake and, and twist stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's still a really good structure and, and it, it still can be used. And I could see that, that something like that could be disassembled and those beams could be used for other applications. So I, I think absolutely. Um, and I think it's a lot easier to reuse timber beams than, than it would be a steel structure. It's just that, you know, it's relatively easy to, to repurpose. But that, again, that, that's my opinion. But, but that absolutely, I think this can be, this can be designed for it and, and planned for it. There's a question from Aaron Marks. I want you to answer it that I, I have an answer as well to the same question. The question is for developers considering mass timber buildings, how do you take advantage of the modeling and prep work from firms like yours? Is it bringing them on early as possible and emphasizing collaboration with your architect? Yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm a huge fan of that. And again, I think we can help with the valve engineering. Usually those, those projects aren't fully thought out because by the time you start bidding it, and we, we had an earlier conversation here, I think new technologies and, and new ways also maybe requires new business models. Often the stuff gets somewhat designed, everybody's in a hurry, there's a deadline and it needs to be sent out for bidding and then the, the cheapest guy gets the job. And usually if, if there are so many people bidding on it, somebody, that misses something gets the job and then you know then they need to compromise and so i, I think it's it's absolutely good to to you know select your team based on confidence based on uh, you know like uh, who works well together and pick your team make clear what you want at, at what budget too and and just say hey this is what we want to build this is the budget let's let's make that work and and then have everybody working together it's just uh, you know a, a design team doesn't have the fabrication or the install knowledge maybe that we have we don't have the design field knowledge that they have and and i think this all needs to be blended together early yes yeah and i want to i want to add in we're going to we're also here from bruno heim of nordic structures um coming up uh, next week 
I think, and then I, I want to reference uh, Aaron Max's question too. I think a lot of the companies bidding or even estimating mass timber projects are doing it based on very little information, no experience. And often they're make, coming up with those numbers based on pricing the material. They don't have any knowledge to understand how, how long will the processing take? How long will, uh, how long will it take and what, what's necessary? What value is added by firms like ours? And really the only way you can know that if you've worked on specifically mass timber projects that have been digitally fabricated. So my advice is engage with the companies that have done it before. They're the ones qualified to give you realistic numbers. So the project is more likely to come in on budget and on schedule. Yeah, yeah, I would agree with that. It's also, it's kind of a pay now, pay later deal too. You may get the cheapest timber package, but then, you know, like stuff doesn't fit now. The install takes twice as long. I really think the biggest savings potential on those buildings is, is that during the, the installation phase. And also, you know, is that building already going to be finished or does, you know, do you have to go in and, and add a lot of, of, of trim work and finish work and, and uh, you know, plugs and fireproofing and stuff. If that's designed smart early on, you're saving a lot of money. And uh, yes, maybe the the kit costs a little more in the beginning, but then then it's done. You don't have to spend like six months doing beam wraps and cover boards and, and stuff like that. And, and these things never look that great. Even if it's done nice, they, you know, stuff shrinks and twists. And so uh, I, I think that's, you know, you have to understand that too. If you save in the front end, you may pay in the back end. Okay, here's a question from Fabiana Saraiva. What is the ideal gap thickness between a column and the beams when using pre-engineered pre-engineered beam hangers? Very good question. And uh, again, uh, you ask 10 professionals and 10 professors, almost like the coronavirus. Everybody is a specialist and everybody has a different <laughs> opinion. So with those knaps, we, we use those basically flush and and with the id you don't need any fire caulking um it, it's tight and they are tight the knap connector allows for a little bit of tolerance because it has a, a tapered thing so that's what i like about it so they're a little bit more forgiving however we're, we're talking within the millimeter um some leave a little gap like a millimeter or two um, that makes it easier. So what we do when we machine, sometimes we run it twice. And so we would always cut it from the same reference site. So that way we're really dialed in. We would run it, we would measure, maybe run it a little shy first. And it's like, okay, well, we want to you know, adjust a little bit. If you have a, a knap connector on two sides and your beam is a little undersized, then, then you're already off. So that's really something we fine tune while we machine. So those we can go tight, um, uh, you know, knife blades and stuff, we would go with an eight for a knife blade cut usually isn't as, as, as accurate as, as a routed out connection. So it depends on the connector, but if you're talking knap and, and pixels and Sherpa connectors, that kind of stuff, you, you can go uh, rotoblast. I hope if I forgot one that doesn't, you know, like I just <laughs> don't take it personal. But, you know, those connections, I think they uh, they need to be dialed in during machining. And we, we like to have the connectors there mounted so we can test it. And I think, I mean, uh, you know, the people who work with us, I think we've been pretty good uh, so far. And if, if really one, you know, sometimes on a big beam, they're maybe not flat or whatnot. So, you know, you can always, you know, losing the screw a little hair to, to make it fit, but but that hasn't been a problem with, with tight. So I would say tight, no more than a millimeter. Here's a question from another one from Luciano. Hi, Stefan, what do you think about the BTL files, which became the standard in Europe? Um, I think it's great. So there is, I, you know, we have that conversation a lot too. For those that don't know what the BTL file is, it's basically a machine code file or like what I would refer as a, as a digital shop drawing. And then it's a process code file. So we're listing different things to do with a certain part. Unlike if you look at the, an ISO G code, which that's just really just pure numbers, right? And, and, and a, a tool path. So we would address, you tell the machine, hey, cut a 10 and instead of just say, go oh, and X that much and Y that much. So that's kind of the difference. Um, so everybody 
that isn't Tandegger, so it's, it's using the BTL format. It's an open source format, and, and I think that's great, and that's the future. Even Handegger, they kind of had their own, they, they are able now to read BTLs. Um, I, I always kind of compare it with Apple versus Android. You know, if you have a, a, an Apple, you know, in the iOS world, everything works. It, it's relatively simple. It's, it's user-friendly. Everything works. Nobody really knows why it works. And you have very little, little opportunity to, to kind of tap into that. And I feel on the Hundegger end, uh, that's a little bit like that too. So they do everything in-house, the, the hardware and the software, and they have their own file format, like a BVX or a BVN. And so they can control it because it's closed. They can control that better. And it's a little easier because those files or file formats are made for their machine. Versus a BTL, a BTL needs to run on a Cruzian, a BSA, and a Uniteam, an SCM. So it runs for all those machines. So in a way, it's more, more uniform. And again, it's an open format. So I can start writing a software now on top of, I don't know what, Rhino, or, and, and create BTL files. People have done that. And, and that's not as simple on, on, on the hand end. So, so yeah, I'm a big fan. I think it's good that that's uh, all open. I'm, I'm a big fan of, of open source stuff. I, I wish we would have more open source formats on, on, on the design end as well and engineering end. So I, I think that's the way to go. So a question, from Blue, another one from Luciano. Do you know the XFIX joint used in Switzerland for a project called Crocodile? XFIX has been applied to the roofing elements by a company called Implania in Zurich. Mm -hmm. Are you? Yeah, I mean, and Plainly has a huge construction company. Yeah, that's probably, um, I don't know what that would compare, but for Swiss things, that's a huge company. They invested quite a bit in timber construction. But yeah, I mean, that's a great project. I don't have much to say there. I, I like that system. Um, uh, they, they did a lot of, of research, and um, so that's pretty impressive. There is a lot of new, I mean, the, the other one we talked about in an earlier presentation is that GSA, uh, Gewinde Stangenanker system uh, from uh, Neue Holz. But there, there's a lot of very innovative systems now for, for mass timber coming from Europe. But um, I always joke, I went through four years of timber engineering school, we never once even talked about seismic design. You know, in Switzerland at the time, that was a non-issue. Now it's a little bit more uh, important, but you know, we have different ways of, of codes and testing and whatnot in the US and it's not all those systems can just be reused one-to-one. -one. And even if they would be better than what we're currently using, they may be not approved or nobody wants to take that risk. But I think that's coming. I mean, we already see that now. There's a Simpson is, is actually doing a lot. They, they have a very similar to a Knapp connector. So we see more US large firms taking over um, sort of European connecting systems and styles. And, and then with that, they do the testing, which is really expensive and whatnot. So, but back to question, a great project. And I think it's a great system. And I'd love to see it in, that, in the US as well. A couple more questions. Here's one from Shamnat. Do you use trusses to stabilize the tall timber buildings? If yes, what kind of connectors do you use? Uh, good question. Yeah, we are actually my very first mass timber building in Switzerland, which was uh, I was working on was the this the school for the university, which I ended up uh, you know just shortly later before it was even done going to school. But they had a big shear wall that was basically a four story tall vertical parallel truss um, that that would stabilize the whole uh, the whole building. Um, so that was that was truss with multiple layer knife blades. I believe it was like three knife blades side by side with tight fit pins. Um, we do uh, more trusses in the U.S. for uh, for roof trusses. Um, uh, our partner company next door, that's what they do a ton. They're really good at that. Uh, Bocharski, they, they do everything from bolt the connections, hit knife blades, side knife plates, uh, bolts, pins, um, that Nike bridge, if I go back here, where was the Nike bridge, for instance, that you, there it is. So the main bridge frame was a truss and that was done with, with two knife plates and, and one inch pins. So uh, so yeah, typically knife plates and pins for trusses. Here's a question. But again, I could see too that, that this is eventually going more in the direction of, of epoxy 
uh, you know, like eater rots and stuff like that. Um, here's a question from Frank Winks. Regarding estimates, can you talk about cost at estimating at the different design stages? In particular, how do you estimate at the early design stages before you can get accurate machine time estimates with more developed models? Well, that's the that's a big question, um, and that's a that's a problem. Like I say, usually these these uh, things go up for bid when when it's either not finished, you know, the design isn't completed, or um, or it's it's designed in a way that you couldn't build. And and I, I it feels and I, I maybe I'm wrong with that, but it feels in the U.S. is almost like a business model. Like the the Swiss guy would just say we can't quote that. There's not enough detail. And the, in America, you just throw a number at and, and ideally low. And then and then once they finish design, it's like oh now we have a golden here. We didn't quote for that, and now it costs a fortune to add that. So that's there seems to be sort of a business model with that. We we don't do that. I don't believe in that but it's like the lowest bit and then and then add for everything that comes so the way we price is our price is typically we look at it and we look at the individual pieces if there's no fab information i mean we know we have to unwrap every beam we have to do at least two precision and cuts and there's probably going to be either some drillings or some knife plates or so so we just kind of do a, a rough estimate them based on, on previous projects or just to say okay this beam would probably take that long to, to process and and then we we look at those beams by um by cross section so larger beams cost more to process if they're really large we have to maybe even hand fab or we have to run them twice and, and so we we would add a, a placeholder price based on that and then we kind of do length units sort of we would just say you know a, a 20 foot beam or a 40 foot beam is probably equals to length units. That's about the same work for us as doing two 20 foot beams. And then, a, you know, if it's a 10 foot beam or a 12 foot beam or even a 12 or a 20, that's almost the same amount of work that doesn't really. So it's, it's really a beam count with certain factors. If we have a detailed model, we would export it. We would simulate the typical beam and just say, okay, this thing has a 20 minute machine run time and we know that costs that much. And then we will price it based on that. And, and I guess the long and the short is the more accurate uh, models or information plans we have, the more accurate we can quote the job. Good answer. Um, here's a one from Emery Baldwin. He states, Hundiger now has a machine that can handle up to 18 inch by 30 inch, inch timbers and glue lambs. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, there. I'm, yeah, I, 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 I don't know the question. I mean, that's great. We wish we would have one of those. I say that years ago when people wrote, I, I think that's where it's going. I would almost argue that it's going to get even bigger. Um, what people don't understand, this isn't just like, hey, let's weld that frame a little bigger. So uh, making a machine bigger, and, and again, like Hundegger could talk about it a lot more than I can, but the, the larger you go, the, the, it's like building a bridge. You improve your span, and then, you know, like the members have have to be bigger. A lot of things with those machines is vibration, deflection, um, you know, accuracy over a, a longer period. So it, it's more difficult to build those big machines to a point where a they, they become. So I mean, I'm sure that that machine is going to start at a million dollars and go up. And, and so certainly you can't cut the four by eight anymore just because a, a machine hour and a machine like that is so incredibly expensive. Um, that that it's hard to to do like normal stuff. Um, so so yes, that's great that they do that. I'm, I'm convinced everybody else will follow. But that's from a, for those of you that are machine builders and whatnot, it, it, it's difficult to do, and and it ends up with a pretty hefty price tag. Um, so here's 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 a, something I want you to address. Uh, there's more information being shared by Luciano regarding his XFIX connectors. And here's another one on the application of elements BBS of 1250 millimeters like binder holds. But here's, here's the question. You, you, you're seeing this, you're familiar with all kinds of products from Switzerland, Austria, Germany, elsewhere, connectors, windows, products, everything. But many of them don't come to the US market. Why is that? And do the Europeans realize that they have to be approved? By, by for regulation and someone has to invest that money yeah 
Yeah, it's a huge problem. I mean, I start with something really, I mean, those I would call those advanced systems, right? But if we're going back to the basic systems, like structural timber screws, I mean, we've, we've been using structural timber screws in Europe for, I don't know, 25 years. Like, I mean, when I started doing, I mean, the screws became pretty quickly, pretty important years and years ago. Um, in the US, I want to say the last, 10 years that became a major market. And yet there is really only one European, and correct me if I'm wrong in that, but for, to my knowledge, there's only one brand that is has all the US and Canadian certifications. And um, the others, they don't. And that doesn't mean that they're not good screws or they're not as good as the others. I think some of them are, are just as good, um, but they don't have the paperwork. And, and you know, if you do your deck at home, that probably doesn't matter. But if you want to do a 10 story high rise or somebody's going to have to sign off on that and, and nobody wants to, because it's like, well, it's probably good, but we don't know. And, okay. and there's also a trend now that some of those, uh, you know, systems are made in Asia and, and, and whatnot. And, and then there is application error. I mean, that's a whole other presentation or conversation as who is applying those and what's the QC on, on that, that then, especially if we're dealing with epoxy connections or stuff that is moisture sensitive and temperature sensitive. But yeah, right. I mean, the long and the short is, I think the biggest hurdle is, is those certifications and it's incredibly expensive uh, to do that. And I think that's something like, uh, you know, organization like Woodworks and others like uh, on, on the government level, there, there should be more support and maybe they need to make that a little bit uh, less costly to, to do all those tests. Well, I, here, I just want to address that issue too, because I'm approached all the time by people with all kinds of products, coatings and windows, and, this, and they want to export to the massive US market. But where the business model is horrible is they're like, well, it's a big market, so the US should pay for all the paperwork. And that's that's ludicrous that thinking um, because it's it is a really big market, but it's also extremely litigious. If there's a problem with your product, there are massive lawsuits, and they're going to go after the legal entity they can when those problems arise, which they do. So if you do want to be in this market, whatever your product or service it is, it has to be legal to use it here. You can't expect someone to assume that legal liability because you're you you as a supplier are unwilling to pay for that. Yeah, it's also, um, I, I see that too, and it, it's tough for a European brain to comprehend that. I mean, we had those discussions with Passive House product. So, I mean, the Passive House window, to me, that was the, the typical example there, right? So there is a highly engineered three-layer panel, super energy efficient, basically the best windows you could buy. You know, so these companies come to the U.S. and they want to sell those windows and they look at the, the windows we're using here, which are just, you know, I mean, some of them are just horrible. Like they're, they're not nearly this is like bringing a Formula One car against some 20 year old Chevy or something. And, and these people, there's like, look, there's every single bit. I mean, pick one part of that car. Everything is like way superior than than, than um than what you guys are currently using. And you're telling me that's not legal. And, and it's like, yeah, it isn't because it's not certified. So uh, what, what people in Europe need to understand, it doesn't matter how good it is, uh, that, that nobody doubts that. It's just, you have to prove that it works here. And, and, and these things are expensive. And then the other problem there is like a lot of those systems came from relatively small companies. So in, in Europe, we don't have oh, as many- Cut out there, uh, at least for me. Um, okay. While I'm waiting for him to come back, I also want to mention uh, Brick and Mortar Ventures and Raymond Levitt, two very big ventures.
So it, it appears maybe um, Greg got lost and I'm still on. Um, so, so yeah, I don't see Greg here either, but we're, I think time-wise it's, it's 10, 20, we're already a little lower. Um, if, if, um, if there is no other question, I think we can wrap that up. And like I say, um, you know, you, most people know how to find us and we're always, I mean, this is stuff we could talk for hours and hours and hopefully it's just a, world turns back to normal we can at some point you know we're always happy to, to give people a shop tour um you know hopefully we can do some beer and wood again or sitting on a wood pile and, and discuss all those issues um so that's that's kind of hopefully that's going to come sooner than later right okay my internet dropped there for a minute but we're we're quite far along we're at quite a few minutes i want it should close soon i think and uh what I would say is, um, uh, let's answer one or two more questions, Stefan, and then just to tell the audience, I think we'll continue to add um, videos and information to the Mass Timber City website, the YouTube channel, and I think the industry would really benefit from case studies on specific buildings, and then having multiple people involved, the architect, the engineer, project manager. Um, we'll try to be adding some of those as well, but here's a, another question, Stefan, from Daniel DePoe. How do you see industrial robots fitting into the industry, given that they haven't been used for timber in the past, dealing with vibration, deflection, et cetera? Um, well, we have quite a bit of first-hand experience there. I'm, I'm a huge believer. I think, Daniel, we talked about that 10 years ago. The reality is those machines are available. They Even new ones came down in price a lot. And so to me, there's two applications. One is all the material handling in highly industrialized operation. So let's just picture you'd have a robot feeding a hand digger and unloading a hand digger or a, or a PS or a cruiser, or whatever CNC machine. So that's that's one application. Um, the other application is that what we've been using is, is basically for milling, right? You put the big uh, spindle on and then the tool changer and, and use it for milling. And, and multiple people have been doing that. The, the big issue still um, in my opinion, is all software. It's, it's incredibly difficult to program those. Um, and we're not on the way, you know, it can't take 10 minutes to cut a, a beam and then two days of programming. That just doesn't work. Like, so it has to be something. I mean, I always choke on our machines. I, I can make a machine file as quickly as, as the guys could put the beam on the machine. And that's kind of how it needs to be. So deflection, vibration, that's that's just a, that's an engineering question. And you need to get a, a sort of a badass big robot. But I, I don't see that. I mean, this is a, some machine companies are sort of saying that. And I, I'm sure that's true to some degree but the question is how much vibration can you have that also has to do with feed speeds and, and whatnot and how much reach you have so I, I don't see that the problem I see the software as the main problem okay let's just do this last question because we've, we've run over time another one from Luciano what are the most important criteria for selecting a new CNC machine mechanics software partner size service and we'll close with that one all of it, all of it, that money. <laughs> no, I mean, you know, we've worked and that, 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 that was a reason we did that. I've, I've worked with many different machines. Um, I, I think, I think all of those machines are great these days. I don't think there is, I mean, the, the different companies went different directions. I think the big, it's like asking which shoe is the best. You know, it's, I think the question needs to be which pair of shoes is the best for me. And if I'm a runner, I don't need a hiking boot, you know? And if I'm a hardcore mountaineer, I probably don't want a lightweight running boot. So I think that's the first thing you, you select the machine based on your product. And that's difficult because, um, you know, maybe when you start out or you buy the machine, that's a 10 year investment. You maybe don't know where that's gonna go. So you want something flexible. Uh, service, I mean, we're, I, I wanna call, 
I would say we're pretty with it because we've been doing it for so long, but, but we need, we need help. There's, there's no way you could just buy one of those things and trying to reverse engineer and figure everything out. So, so to me, that, that, that is a partnership deal where you to some degree are kind of married with, with your supplier. And then the software is huge. I mean, if you can't get those files ready or like with the robot where it takes forever, then the whole machine uh, becomes limited um so so i would say building quality although i really don't think there's a machine that is built really horrible anymore i i, I think that's that's one factor mechanical engineering uh but it, it's more like what machine what the product um what service what software um and then um and then yeah i guess space restriction sometimes too you know shop space is expensive so how big is a machine how is that you know some machine like our machine is very compact but it requires a nine foot hole into the ground that's not cheap and and so there's there's pros and cons i hope that answers your question but it, it's a big investment and you want to pick that good i think Right. Thank you. Let's let's close with that. We've gone way over time, but thank you, our audience, for sticking around. I hope that answered your questions, and we'll post this online and contact us to follow up. Both Stefan and myself have cut my timber. Thank you. Yeah. Same here. Thanks for listening. Like I say, we're here. I mean, people in the industry know us, and and we're always happy to you know uh, answer questions.